Hey everyone, it's Glenn Greenwald back with a new episode of System Update exclusively on Rumble. And I wanted to cover the most recent and one of the most egregious examples of the Democratic Party using its majoritarian power in Washington, its control over both houses of Congress and the White House, to pressure, coerce, threaten, and otherwise manipulate big tech monopolies to censor the internet in accordance with the Democratic Party's political interests and political perspectives. This is an issue I've been reporting on for almost the entire year, probably more than almost any other, because it's extraordinary or extraordinary to me to watch what is essentially now this union of state and corporate power that is increasingly uniting to police our political speech over the internet, this innovation that was supposed to liberate us from exactly this kind of centralized control. And yet because of these 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 dynamics, these these ten, these trends, it has become arguably the most potent weapon of censorship yet. Now, the most recent uh, case that I wanted to um, report on is one that involves uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, the Democrat from uh, Massachusetts and Congressman Adam Schiff, the Democrat from California, both of whom have written letters to Amazon demanding that Amazon censor or otherwise promote material or suppress material in accordance with they, Senator Warren and Congressman Schiff, believes is the truth or not the truth or good politics or not good politics and are using their power as members of Congress and the majoritarian party to do so. Now, this is something that has been going on, as I indicated, for quite some time, and it's something that I've been reporting on for quite a while. In fact, in the last year alone, on at least four separate occasions, the Democratic Party in both the House and the Senate has used their power in charge of committees to summon tech executives of Facebook, Google, Twitter to their committees and essentially tell them with increasing degrees of explicitness that if they don't start censoring the internet, removing material in accordance with the wishes of the Democratic Party, they will retaliate, the Democratic Party will, using the executive branch power of regulation and the congressional power of legislation to punish these companies for their disobedience. And that's not my interpretation. They're saying that explicitly. It's why they keep hauling them before Congress. So here in February of this year, uh, the headline that I uh, of the article I wrote was Congress escalates pressure on tech giants to censor more, threatening the First Amendment. It was about the House Democrat zeal for control of online speech. I returned to this uh, topic on March 26, which was the day of yet another hearing that was convened before the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House. And I watched the entire hearing and reported on what had happened. And I was actually shocked under the headline, Congress in a five-hour hearing demands tech CEOs censor the internet even more aggressively. I watched one Democrat after the next tell the CEOs of Google, Facebook, and Twitter that they will suffer regulatory and legal reprisals if they do not censor the internet more aggressively to take down what the Democratic Party regards as disinformation or as hate speech. Now, you can go through the reporting to see how often this has happened here from October of 2020 is the Washington Post report, which says Facebook, Google, Twitter CEOs clash with Congress in pre-election showdown. So that was October of last year when that happened here from the New York Times the following month in November, reporting on a Senate hearing that this where the same thing happened. Zuckerberg and Dorsey face harsh questioning from Lawmakers, it says Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, Jack Dorsey of, ta of Twitter, testified about their platforms, misinformation, and the 2020 election. Here we have another example from February, the, the hearing I reported on, when the Energy and Commerce Committee proudly announced a hearing with tech CEOs on the misinformation and disinformation plaguing online platforms. And then here you can see the letter that Senator Warren wrote on September 7th to the CEO of Amazon, and the, it's a long letter. It's the one that the Guardian article was about where she essentially tells Amazon, I'm extremely angry about your ongoing promotion of books that I don't think should be promoted, and I demand that you take action to stop this. Let's look at what she wrote in the, in the body of this letter to the Amazon CEO. Quote, 
I write regarding concerns that Amazon is peddling misinformation about COVID-19 vaccines and treatments through its search and quote, bestseller algorithms. This is the second time in six months, second time in six months that I have identified Amazon practices that mislead consumers about COVID-19 prevention or treatment. Earlier this year, I wrote regarding concerns that the company is providing consumers with false and misleading information about FDA authorized KN95 masks. Now what she's talking about there is that Amazon is selling and promoting books that say things about COVID and the pandemic that Elizabeth Warren dislikes and doesn't want people hearing. How is that a role of a senator to do? She goes on, quote, this pattern and practice of misbehavior, misbehavior suggests that Amazon is either unwilling or unable to modify its business practices to prevent the spread of falsehoods or the sale of inappropriate products. An ethical, an unethical, unacceptable, and potentially unlawful course of action from one of the nation's largest retailers talking to the CEO of Amazon as she's as if, as if she's a nursery school teacher or a school mom chiding him for what she calls his misbehavior meaning selling books that Senator Warren doesn't like and doesn't want anyone to read she then goes on at a time when every step toward ending the pandemic could save countless lives misinformation poses a substantial obstacle in February of 2020 the World Health Organization declared end quote infodemic to describe the difficulty of finding reliable information about COVID-19 in today's media environment. She went on, given the seriousness of this issue, I ask that you perform an immediate review about Amazon's algorithms and within 14 days provide both a public report on the extent to which Amazon's algorithms are directing consumers to books and other products containing COVID-19 misinformation and a plan to modify these algorithms so that they no longer do so. And then she ends her letter uh, with this demand. In order to fully understand Amazon's role in facilitating misinformation about COVID-19, I also request responses to the following questions by September 22nd. And she then lists four different demands for information from Amazon that she wants provided to her, including how they structure their algorithm and what rationale they use to promote certain books or not promote other books to basically come before the government and explain themselves about why they're allowing certain books to be found. Now, I just want to highlight one amazing part of the letter that we just looked at, which is where Senator Warren warns Amazon, reminds them that in February of 2020, the WHO was very concerned about what they described as an infodemic, which was the difficulty to find reliable information about COVID-19. Do you know who made it very difficult in that time period, February 2020, when they were coining this new term infodemic? Do you know who made it so difficult to find reliable information about the pandemic? It was Dr. Anthony Fauci and the World Health Organization, who exactly at that time, I will remind you, in March of 2020, here from CNN, the World Health Organization stands by their recommendation not to wear masks if you are not sick or not caring for someone who is sick. Now, just think about this for a minute. If in February or March of 2020, when the World Health Organization, in Elizabeth Warren's words, was warning about the dangers and menaces of an infodemic, the difficulty of finding reliable information, if you had gone on to Facebook or Twitter or YouTube, or if you had written a book that was sold on Amazon in which you urge people to wear masks, even if they weren't symptomatic, or sick or caring for someone who was, the WHO and Dr. Fauci and Elizabeth Warren would have condemned you for spreading disinformation. In other words, if just a year ago you had said what they're now saying, because it diverged from the consensus of these authorities, you would have been responsible for this infodemic, for making it difficult. You see how rapidly they change their decrees and each time demand that you never question what they're saying, even though the history of the pandemic from these institutions has been nothing but one error after the next, to put it most generously. Now, here is a similar boast from Congressman Adam Schiff, 
who's always an ironic figure to be warning about the dangers of disinformation, given that he was one of the leaders, maybe the most vocal leader in Congress, spending four years spreading the most demented conspiracy theory the media has endorsed in decades, that Russia had taken over the United States through clandestine blackmail control over Donald Trump, claiming falsely that he has seen evidence proving collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russians to interfere in the 2016 election, even though Robert Mueller, with all his subpoena power after 18 months, concluded he could not find evidence to establish it. This is the guardian of disinformation who wants to censor the internet to keep you safe from propaganda and deceit. That's the person who wants to do that. And in order to do that, here's what he's saying. Vaccine hesitancy stands between us and the end of the pandemic, and companies like Amazon and Facebook must do far more to tackle the viral spread of misinformation online, we need transparency and we need accountability. Lives are on the line. And he then shows off his very similar letters as the ones Elizabeth Warren wrote. He wrote one not just to Amazon, but also to Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, which you can see there. And then a similar letter to the CEO of Amazon. And he essentially is trying to arrogate unto himself the power to police what you should and shouldn't be allowed to to hear upon threat to these companies if they disobey of punishing them with regulatory and legal retaliation. Do you trust Adam Schiff and Elizabeth Warren to be the arbiters of what we can and can't hear of what is true and false after everything that they've done? Do you trust any institution or any politician to do that? I don't, which is why I find behavior like this so disturbing. Now, speaking of disturbing, let us look at... One of the most amazing excerpts, vignettes, exchanges from that hearing that I reported on, that five-hour hearing in March. And this is an exchange between the uh, three CEOs of those tech companies and Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher, who is a Democrat of Texas, in which she basically demands that they accept the government handing them lists of what she calls domestic terror organizations – and then obeying that list by removing and banning whatever groups the government, the Congress or the executive branch with no trial or hearing, tells the tech companies constitute domestic terrorist organizations or otherwise extremist groups and therefore be removed from the Internet. Listen to her in her own words say this. And even the tech company uh, CEOs, although obviously trying to be deferential to these people who can destroy their company, are obviously taken aback by how extreme the suggestion is. Just watch it. Well, thank you. So I, I appreciate all of your willingness to uh, to work with us and to assist Congress in addressing this attack on, on our capital and, and on our country. Another uh, idea that I would like to touch base with you on in the time I have left, uh, just over a minute, is the difference we see in how your platforms handle foreign extremist content versus domestic content. And by all accounts, your platforms do a better job of combating posts and information from foreign terrorist organizations or FTOs like ISIS or Al Qaeda um, and others where the posts are automatically removed, depending on keywords and phrases, um, et cetera. But FTOs are designated by the State Department through rigorous criteria to identify groups that wish to come, cause harm to Americans. But currently, there's no legal mechanism or definition for doing the same for domestic terror and hate groups. Would a federal standard for defining a domestic terror organization similar to FTOs help your platforms better track and remove harmful content from your sites? Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg? Congresswoman, I'm not sure. I think in, in domestically, we do classify a number of white supremacist organizations and you know, militias and conspiracy networks like QAnon um, as the, the same level of problematic as is, 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 um, is, is some of these other organizations that are able to take decisive action. I think where this ends up being more complicated I, is where the content is I hate to cut you off, but I'm going to run out of time. So your answer was, I'm not sure. Uh, can I just get a quick yes or no from Mr. Dorsey and Mr. Pichai? Yes, and then we'll very quickly, because your time has expired. Oh. Just very quickly. We, we need to evaluate it. We need to understand what that means. I think as, as domestic agencies focus on it, I think we are happy to work and uh, cooperate there. Okay, well, Jeff, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Now, you notice there, Jack Dorsey is sitting in his kitchen in front of a big bowl of plates, and the contempt that he evinced for that question appropriately was one that he more or less displayed throughout the entire five hours as he made clear how inappropriate 
he thought it was. I don't want to speak for him, but that was certainly what he conveyed in his actions and words for the government to be badgering him over and over about what content he should and should not be allowed to have on his platform, accompanied by threats of punishment from the government if he doesn't obey the party with majority power. Now, what's really helpful, I guess, is that I don't need to convince you that the view of Democrats is that they want social media monopolies and giants to censor more rather than less because they keep saying it over and over themselves in words that couldn't be clearer. So here from November is the Senate hearing where the newly elected, uh, reelected Senator Ed Markey, reelected with the help of lots of left-wing activists, told Facebook right to their face what his problem is. Listen to what he told them. The big tech business model, which puts profits ahead of people, is a real problem. Anti-conservative bias is not a problem. The issue is not that the companies before us today are taking too many posts down. The issue is that they're leaving too many dangerous posts up. In fact, they're amplifying harmful content so that it spreads like wildfire and tortures our democracy. His problem, he said, is not that the companies before us are censoring too little, but, but too much, but that they're censoring too little. And he's concerned, he said, for his de the democracy. The democracy apparently can only be salvaged if con de de senators like him have the right to tell social media companies what ideas can be expressed and can't. Now, to me, the most disturbing the gravest act of censorship at the direction of the Democratic Party that didn't get as much attention as it deserved was the destruction of Parler in early January. Because for so long, what we heard, those of us who have been objecting to attempts to censor social media platforms was, oh, these aren't monopolies. You can just go and create a new Twitter if you don't like how Twitter is censoring. Go create a new Facebook. And the people who uh, used to work for Ron Paul and Rand Paul and came out of not a MAGA movement, but a libertarian movement, heard that and took it seriously and said, we're going to go do that. We're going to go create our own social media platform designed to allow free speech instead of to crush it. And they called it Parler. And in early January of this year, it became the single most downloaded app in the entire country, more than TikTok, more than YouTube, more than Instagram, Facebook, every single one. The single most popular app that Americans wanted on their telephones because it provided and guaranteed free speech instead of crushed it. Parler barely exists any longer, just six months later. So they kept saying, oh, just go create your own. Parler did it. They became wildly successful. Fast forward, not even six months later, and Parler exists in name only. Why? Because Democrats demanded that big tech monopolies that fund their party destroy it, and they obeyed. So here is Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on January 8th of 2021, quoting a tweet from the liberal group Sleeping Giants, whose whole existence is to get material they don't like politically censored off the internet, claiming that Parler is allowing for calls uh, for violence and blaming them for the planning of the January 6th riot as well as the January 20th uh, inauguration riots they claim were coming that actually never came. Now, the reality was there was much more planning done for the January 6th riot at the Capitol on platforms like Facebook and others than there was on Parler, but Sleeping Giants wanted Parler gone for political reasons, and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, using her 12 million plus follower platform on Twitter, and the fact that she's part of a party that was about to take over every branch of government, at least Congress and, and, and the White House, said, what are Apple and Google doing about this? She just demanded that those companies destroy Parler. She pointed out Apple and Google because as that Saving Giant tweets pointed out, that's the stores on which Parler relied for to enable people to download. She was as clear as she could get. She wanted Apple and Google to stop Parler. Once one of them, uh, Apple, 
did so and announced that they were removing Parler from their Play Store, which meant not only that people couldn't download it in the future, but even if you had already downloaded it, it would only be functional for a little while longer because you were no longer able to get the updates that you need to keep it functional. She said, Google, what are you going to do about apps being used to organize violence on your platform? Now, Google has a platform called YouTube where a lot of the January 6th planning and promoting had been done, but she wanted to bully a smaller app that was more associated with a political ideology that she dislikes. So she demanded that Apple and Google, social uh, big tech monopolies, destroy Parler. Another member of Congress who's a Democrat, Ro Khanna, did the same thing. He set his sights on Amazon, which hosted the Parler on its web service, saying Parler is hosted by Amazon Web Services. Amazon should deny Parler services until January 21st, unless they commit to removing all posts related to incitement of violence concerning inauguration. He was at least a little more moderate, conditioning his demand for their removal and limiting it uh, in terms of time than AOC was, who just wanted Parler gone. But nonetheless, he was also irrigating to himself the power to call for Parler's destruction. And what happened after Democrats like that demanded Parler's destruction? The New York Times on January 9th, just a day later, had this article, Amazon, Apple, and Google cut off Parler, an app that drew Trump supporters. And even their own subheadline said the company pulled support, the companies pulled support for the quote, free speech network, all but killing the service just as many conservatives are seeking alternatives to Facebook and Twitter. So the New York Times was very clear about what the motive was. It was to prevent people who have ideologies different than these Democrats from being able to express themselves on social media. A day after those influential Democrats demanded that these big tech giants destroy Parler, they obeyed and Parler was gone. Now, we don't even have to speculate on what the motive was for why these companies did it. It was provided by longtime Hillary Clinton senior aide Jennifer Palmieri, who went on Twitter on the day that the Democrats had won the Georgia Georgia Senate uh, elections, which meant they were going to have the majority not just at the House and control the White House, but also the Senate. And that was the same day that Twitter kicked off Donald Trump, much to the consternation of world leaders, including Angela Merkel in, in France and Emmanuel Mac uh, Angela Merkel in Germany and Emmanuel Macron in France and President Lopez Obrador in Mexico, all of whom condemned it as very anti-democratic. But most liberals celebrated and Jennifer Palmieri explained what the real power dynamic going on was. This is what she said. I find this tweet incredibly candid and important. She wrote, it has not escaped my attention that the day social media companies decided there actually is more they could do to police Trump's destructive behavior was the same day they learned Democrats would chair all the congressional committees that oversee them. That's exactly what happened. She's totally right. And she's celebrating it. She's saying these companies obey Democratic censorship orders because they know the Democrats, as of January 20th, are the ones in charge and they want to aggrandize and appease the party in power by kicking their political adversaries off the Internet. Imagine being so deranged as to think that's a positive thing, that the Democrats get to use their power and influence in Washington to censor the Internet in accordance with their wishes because these tech giants are petrified of what they might do if they don't obey. Now, it's not just Democratic elite senators, members of Congress, Hillary Clinton, longtime Clinton apparatchiks. It's Democrats in general who favor using state and corporate power to censor the Internet, to silence their political adversary. And how do I know that? Because polling data makes it incredibly clear. Here is a Gallup poll from, or excuse me, a Pew Research poll from last month. Headline, quote, more Americans now say government should take steps to restrict false information online than in 2018. Who are these more Americans than in 2018 now want the government, the government to take steps to take information off the Internet in the name of combating information? It's very clear if you look at the partisan breakdown, it's Democrats. Here you see. The chart, it asks, quote, the U.S. government should take steps to restrict false information online, even if it limits freedom of information. That blue line, very high up, 65 percent, are Democrats who, who agree the government should, should take steps to censor the Internet. The low red line are Republicans, only 28 percent. 
the people who say tech companies should take steps to restrict false information on, uh, online, even if it means freedom of, of information is even starker. 76% of Democrats say that tech companies should censor the internet, only 37% of Republicans. So you can see that this has become a foundational view of the Democratic Party and American liberalism, that the internet should be censored to keep their political adversaries silent. Now, a lot of people, when this issue is raised, a lot of liberals in particular, very ironically say what has long been the conservative view of how the free market should work, which is, oh, these are just private companies. They can do whatever they want. They can censor who they want. They can platform who they want. It's kind of odd coming from a political movement that thought it was such a grave attack and assault on basic liberties for a tiny little bakery owned by Christians to refuse to bake cakes celebrating same-sex weddings to say private businesses can do whatever they want. But that is this laissez-faire, almost libertarian economic policy that they've adopted to justify this censorship. But what's really important to note about that, besides that incredible ideological hypocrisy, is that it's just not true that private companies can do whatever they want. If the state is essentially threatening and coercing them to censor, then it becomes a serious First Amendment violation. In other words, the state knows, Democrats know, they can't directly censor. They can't pass laws requiring Amazon to take books off of Amazon or ban certain people from being on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube. They know they can't do that. So what they're trying to do is circumvent that constitutional constraint by censoring indirectly, by essentially commandeering the power of these private tech giants and using it as their own by threatening those companies to do the censoring for them. That's what's going on. And it is clear under the law that the First Amendment is violated not only when the state directly censors political speech, but when they indirectly censor it by coercing or threatening private actors to do it for them. Now, in the course of my reporting, I interviewed one of the best lawyers at the ACLU, who's Ben Wisner, and he's the director of their speech privacy and technology project, one of the few remaining old school ACLU lawyers who really does believe in social in civil liberties for everyone. And this is what he told me at the time that the Democrats were holding these hearings, badgering tech executives to censor in accordance with their will, quote, for the same reasons that the Constitution prohibits the government from dictating what information can be seen and read outside narrow limits, it also prohibits the government from using its immense authority to coerce private actors into censoring on its behalf. Now, he said that that analysis is a complex one, it wasn't clear that the Democrats had yet risen to the level of coercion, though he wasn't saying it wasn't. But he was saying that in principle, if the government starts pressuring and threatening and coercing private companies enough to censor, it can violate the First Amendment. And there's a lot of fascinating case law where the Supreme Court has said exactly that. One of the most vivid cases is a 1963 case called Bantam Books, Inc. versus Sullivan, where some county officials or municipal officials in Rhode Island were badgering a bookstore because the bookstore was displaying in the window and otherwise selling books that the members of the city commission thought were too risque or were immoral and wanted taken down. And they knew they couldn't order the bookstore to do it. So they began harassing them and threatening them with all kinds of ancillary reprisals. And so the bookstore finally sued, as did various distributors, saying, yes, they're not directly censoring us. They didn't pass laws forcing us to do it, but they're pressuring and threatening us so much that it effectively amounts to forcing us to censor these books on their behalf, and that violates the First Amendment, and the Supreme Court agreed. And it's worth taking a look at their reasoning. This is the crux of this decision. This is the Supreme Court in 1963. It is true, as noted by the Supreme Court of Rhode Island, that the book distributor was free to ignore the commission's notices in the sense that his refusal to cooperate would have violated no law, meaning the commission did not enact a law. And therefore, technically, the Supreme Court is acknowledging they're free if they want to, to ignore the censorship requests, just like Facebook and Amazon and Google are technically free legally to do so. The port then said, though, 
but it was found as a fact and the finding being amply supported by the record binds us that the book distributors compliance with the commission's directives was not voluntary. People do not lightly disregard public officers thinly veiled threats to institute criminal proceedings against them if they do not come around. And the distributor's reaction, according to uncontroverted testimony, was no exception to this general rule. The commission notices, phrased virtually as, or the commission's notices, phrased virtually as orders, reasonably understood such to, to be such by the distributor, invariably followed up by police visitations. In fact, stopped the circulation of the listed publications. Uh, by its own force, this Latin term meaning by its own force, it would be naive to credit the state's assertions, naive to believe the state when they say that these blacklists are in the nature of mere legal advice, when they plainly serve as instruments of regulation. The court concluded, in sum, their operation was in fact a scheme of state censorship effectuated by extra legal sanctions. They acted as an agency not to advise but to suppress. Now, I just walked you through the long list of threats of retaliation and punishment that Democratic Party members of Congress and other officials have been issuing to big temp companies over the last year in the form of letters and hearings and all kinds of regulatory actions where they're over and over demanding and identifying the specific post that they want taken down, in the words of Senator Markey. And we now have Senator Warren this week and Congressman Schiff writing directly to Amazon, in the case of Congressman Schiff, also to Facebook, saying there are books that you're allowing to be sold and there are posts that you're allowing to be read that we don't think you should be allowing the public to hear and we are going to take serious action against you if you don't stop that. It's very easy to see how completely the Supreme Court's reasoning applies, that this operation is in fact a scheme of state censorship effectuated by extra legal sanctions. They're acting as an agency not to advise, but to suppress. So it's not just disturbing to any person who believes in democracy and freedom to see the state and the corporation in a union to censor and police our political speech. All these people claiming to be so worried about fascism for the last five years sure do seem to be very uh, accommodating and hospitable to this state and corporate union of power. One of the classic definitions, academically at least, of fascism. It's not just that. It's that it seems clearly to be reaching the line if it hasn't already well passed it, where the Democratic Party is now violating the First Amendment rights of not just these social media companies, but all of us as users by continuously abusing their power of the state to censor in a way that they themselves can't do directly. This is a story that deserves a lot more attention. It's been why I've been reporting on every step of it along the way. The internet is the, the, the instrument that was supposed to liberate us from dependency on centralized state and corporate control to communicate with one another freely, which is why it was such a uh, celebrated as a, an invention of liberation and democratization, and yet it's being turned by this behavior often cheered primarily by liberal journalists into an unprecedented tool of coercion, constraint, and control.